Hello everyone, today I'd like to talk to you about the Ferrari F355 GTS. Now, those of you who've been watching the channel for quite some time may recognize this as the exact same car that I drove about two years ago now when I just got my Lotus Evora and started the channel. Now, there's a few reasons that I'm driving this car today. Number one, you'd take every opportunity you could get to drive this, wouldn't you? Number two, that video that I did, being one of my first, really wasn't the best. And there's lots of things that I wish I could have done better at the time, and I know now that I can. So really see this almost as a remastered version of that video. Thirdly, I've seen a lot of people on the YouTube scene buy one of these or one of the other Ferraris from the similar time period and comment on what they think they're really like to own, the running costs of them, and all this sort of stuff. And I think they're making a few fundamental mistakes when they look at these cars. Now, this particular car has been owned by a close friend of the family for 21 years and I've known it and him that whole time. So I think I'm fairly well positioned to tell you guys the truth about owning a Ferrari 355. Now, aside from being one of the prettiest cars ever to come from Maranello, this is also one of the most important. I think we all know the story of how the Honda NSX forced Ferrari to reevaluate just how expensive, practical and reliable their cars could be before owners started complaining. Honda had proven with the NSX that you could have supercar looks and pace with regular car reliability and running costs. Now at the time, this was Ferrari's riposte and it featured a number of then very advanced features. You have magnesium wheels, you have titanium conrods in an engine that spins to over eight and a half thousand RPM, you have a five valve head. Now that was very significant, in fact it was so significant that's where the name of this car comes from, 355. Three and a half litre, five valve per cylinder. Ferrari were very proud of this car. And there's more. This car also had adjustable dampers with comfort and sport settings in 1994, it was the first car to introduce a butterfly valve in the exhaust so it could pass noise or eggs, but sound tasty when you're pressing on. In 1997, they introduced the now much maligned F1 gearbox, but at the time it was also very advanced. However, in 2018, it isn't really what was forward thinking about the 355 that makes it so appealing, but rather what was more classic about it. You see, really, the 355 was the end of an era. It was the last all-steel mid-engined V8 Ferrari, and the last truly classic car to come out of Maranello. And that brings with it things both good and bad. Let me show you some of the stuff I think's very cool. Now this is a truly classic Ferrari interior. I've known this car since it arrived in July of 1997 to its current owner. It's a 1995 car and yet somehow it still smells the same. It's Connolly leather and this is such a beautiful place. Now these yellow bits of trim which are also on the fly-off handbrake were done at this owner's request and I think liven up what would be otherwise a slightly drab interior. Now this car is a pre-facelift model. There's a couple of easy ways to identify that. First off, it's got this beautiful, thin, classic looking Ferrari steering wheel. The other way to tell is in the engine bay. But before we go there, I want you just to admire, first off, this six speed classic open gated shifter and these wonderful dials. Less so the fairly cheap looking Alpine cassette player there is a CD changer up front. But really, I don't think this is what people think of when they think of a Ferrari if you're young. But if you're a little bit older, this is still rather special. Ferrari call this the F129B, and it is close to the final evolution of the Dino motor. Now, Unlike many later Ferrari engine bays, you have no glass cover on it, and it's a very, very mechanical, and I think pure thing to look at. To me, this is what a Ferrari should be. No contrived fancy stuff, just engineering. 
Now, a lot of people will look at the engine bay and see it and think that the engine is here. It's not. These are just the intake plenums. The actual engine is down here. See here? This is the top of the head. This thing sits low. My favorite feature though, these things. They've got serial numbers on the covers of the air intake box. Why? Because Ferrari. Now under here, you have a lot more room than you would possibly think. It's a slightly odd arrangement as the lid reveals nearly the entire front of the car, which is all beautifully covered in carpet. There's a couple of access panels here. One hides the fuse box and the other the battery isolation switch. You see, Ferrari tragically knew that as good as these cars were, they were going to spend most of their lives in a garage. Now, in here, we currently have the car's cover. Now, this was recently replaced. Now, it never actually fit this car very well, and I thought that's just because, you know, Ferrari could never be bothered with things like making car covers fit. Actually, it turns out the reason it doesn't fit the car well is because it was an F50 cover, an original Ferrari F50 cover. They were just giving it away at the time. Now, this car also has pop-up headlamps, another little classic thing, but by far the coolest thing under here is the toolkit. It's bound in this beautiful brown case and it contains Ferrari branded tools, screwdrivers, spanners. You also have belts. Spare bulb kit, towing eye, Ferrari branded pliers, and an inflation kit. I mean, I love Ferrari. I really, really do. And there's something delightfully old school about the thought that one of their owners is going to want to replace a belt on the side of the road. And now's a good a time as any to talk about that thorniest of Ferrari issues, service costs. You can't go anywhere online and search 355 without some smart Alec telling you that it's going to cost 10 grand to change the cam belt, which is due every three months. And you know, the moment you get it home, it's going to instantly burst into Italian flames and everything about it is going to be horrible and horrendous and nightmarish. And honestly, it's just a mixture of bullshit and truth. That's, that's honestly what it is. Now, the fact of the matter is that the 355 is from the past. And the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. We now live in this era where people think they can buy supercars and have them nearly for free. Now, I've talked about stuff like this when I did my GT3 financing and prices video. You know, people look at Ferraris and stuff, they go, oh, I can buy a Ferrari and I'm hardly going to lose any money on it. And I'll just finance it and get it. And they have service packs and all this stuff. And they think supercar ownership can be cheap. Well, the truth was supercar ownership never was cheap. Supercar ownership was horrendously expensive. The 355, when it was new, cost under £100,000. In fact, when they came out, they were closer to about £80,000. And by today's standards, that's really not a lot. That's less than a well-spec RS6. But you could be guaranteed if you bought a 355 or a 360 or something like that new, in a few years, you were going to lose a significant amount of money. I know a chap that bought a 360 and he lost 60 grand on it. There wasn't anything that went wrong with the car. That's just how it was you needed to be earning a lot of money to be able to afford to run one of these. Now, in terms of servicing, if you want to take these to Ferrari main dealers, of course, it's going to cost you a lot. That dreaded cam belt change is due between three and five years, depending on who you ask. Officially, it's a two-day engine out job. In the 360, they put a little access panel behind the seats. So the cam belt's still in the same place. It's just ahead of the engine but you can get to it from inside the car, and that's why the 360 is a lot cheaper to maintain. The 430 doesn't have a cam belt at all, and it's much cheaper to maintain again. Now, 
To do this at a specialist costs between two to three thousand pounds. That's every three to five years. Minor and major services are not horrendous. The high hundreds to low thousands. It will vary depending on where you go. Parts prices are generally quite reasonable. Discs, pads and so on, there's plenty of non-OEM options that are just as good, if not better. Tires are not expensive. A 225 is the front. I can buy front tires for this car for about 100 quid a side, and that's good ones. So it's really not horrific in that sense. Yes, if things break, it can be quite expensive. It is, after all, still a Ferrari. And there's a lot of people out there who've gone and bought bad examples of these and then found they need to spend a hell of a lot of money to put them right. And they've managed to get a bad reputation thanks to that. Now, one of the items that the internet tells you will absolutely positively fail on these, and they are absolutely right, is this interior switch gear. Uh, you can see down here on the little ashtray, it's gone all a bit nasty and sticky and gooey. It's an exact same thing on the door handle, see all this? And they are kind of sticky to the touch. Switches the same. See around the barrel here, got all a bit gooey and nasty. Uh, this is why I have the car this weekend. You see these bits are gonna get removed and sent away. There is a gentleman in America by the name of Dave, runs a company called Sticky RX Refinishing Solutions. Now we previously sent this piece off to him and you can see a dramatic difference between the two. That is much better than that. He does a perfect job and he's in Buffalo, New York and it's a long way from England to send these parts but as I'm actually going to be there next week I'm going to be hand delivering them to him. So he does a fantastic job and he's the only person in the world we trust to refurb these and do them exactly right so a big shout out to him for helping keep this car in tip-top condition now it recently had the cats replaced but i think they did pretty well lasting 22 years now okay this car's only done just under 17,000 miles which isn't a lot but leaving a car sat still for a long period of time is not actually the best thing for it so you can expect to have quite a few issues but since the early noughties, this car has started on the button and ran like a dream every single time. That last major issue I spoke of, one of the car's ECUs was just misbehaving a little bit. That, by the way, is the other way that you can tell this car apart from a later car. This car has two completely separate paths in the engine bay for the air, it has two MAF sensors, basically two of everything. Later cars join in the middle and run the later Motronic 5.2 system rather than the 2.7 that this car has. People generally prize these earlier cars over the later ones. Ferrari didn't officially call it a facelift or anything like that and they look pretty much the same, but later cars were a bit heavier and a bit slower. Now, of course, buying one of these these days is not cheap anymore. I was Googling earlier and I found a little buyer's guide on these which said you could pick up a nice one for about 35 to 40 grand. Unfortunately, that was in 2009. This particular car now is worth well over 100. Now, of course, all this maintenance and hassle and the general fear that comes with owning any Ferrari can only really be justified if it's any good to drive. So let's find out. Now, whether this car meets your expectations or not is going to depend very heavily on what your expectations are. If you're getting into this and expecting a Ferrari, you are going to be disappointed. No two ways about that, not gonna lie to you. On modern roads, especially tight, twisty, little windy roads like I love, this thing would be utterly destroyed by a competently driven Golf GTI. Just that's, that's just what happens with 24 years of progress. No shame in that whatsoever. However, if you are expecting a classic car, this thing is just glorious. 
Now, it does have one of the best soundtracks to grace any car ever. This particular one has a completely standard exhaust, or so I'm told. It does sound a little different to others that I've heard. It's recently had those cats replaced, but as far as I know, they weren't sports cats that went in or anything fancy like that, and it does still sound pretty much just like it always did. And it's got this lovely symphony to it. At low speeds, it's got a very busy sort of hum. And then at about three and a half, four thousand 4,000 RPM, it becomes an awful lot more mechanical. At higher RPM, of course, it does scream, but bear in mind, this is no Capristo Stage 3 setup, so it won't wail like you've heard it on YouTube. Now, although it does feel a little slow, that due in part to the fact that it's only got 260 pound-foot of torque at 6,000 RPM, What's really impressive is just the way that this engine spins so freely. It's actually quite similar in some ways to my Evora in that you put it in third gear and you put your foot down and you don't think a lot has happened. And then you look at the speedo and you realize that it has. Now, there's an awful lot of room in this cab but I am sat in that classic Italian driving position, my knees very bent. Now this gear change, let's talk about it because it's such an iconic part of Ferrari ownership. Okay, what are you doing? Perils are YouTubing people. Someone thought they saw something dangling off the car. Turns out it was a camera. Now you may be able to see from this camera that I've brought my friend James along because he's going to help me with some of the drive-bys later and this is his first go out in one of these. I mean I just love all the old dials, it's great. I mean one of the things I really don't like about my Lotus is a general lack of dials and this car's so old school in its approach. You've got oil temp, you've got fuel gauge, you've got a very very wrong clock and you've of course you've got speedo, rev counter and you've got oil pressure. How many cars now give you an oil pressure gauge? And it rides really well. It's easy to drive. Now, when it's cold, second gear, don't even try it. It just will not be home. But that was the case with sort of a lot of the cars of this era. Just, you know, you talk to anyone that owned a classic Ferrari back in the day and they'll generally tell you, yeah, a lot of the even numbered gears only make an appearance after the car's been warmed through for about five or ten minutes. Now, in terms of practicality, this is not a great car. Yes, it has a reasonably sized boot, but ingress and egress, certainly into anything resembling a multi-story car park, Eh, forget it. Now the truth is it's not because the car's so low. The car doesn't really ride that much lower than a lot of saloon cars that I've driven. It's that front overhang. Ferrari love long front overhangs. It means they've got a very short wheelbase which does make it quite nippy and darty. But it means that the angle of attack you can achieve is very very shallow. The 550 is probably even worse. You look at one of those for a big long front engine car very narrow wheelbase, very short wheelbase. This is a noticeably smaller car than the cars which followed it. The 360 was a noticeable size up and the current 458 and 488, they dwarf it. They're absolutely massive by comparison. Now, somewhere like the USA, not really a problem. In the UK, can be an issue. And the thing with Ferraris is that each generation of Ferrari moves the game on so much. I have driven a 360, but no others so far. I'm hoping to improve that fairly soon. And of course, when I do, I'll be keen to see just how different they are. But even on the spec sheet, just the leaps that Ferrari make are incredible. I mean, from this to the 348, Ferrari added about 80 horsepower. A massive jump, 300 to 380, that's huge. It's 30% more go.
Now this car is currently wearing very, very old tyres. They are over a decade old and therefore I am not going to be throwing this car into any corners with any sort of dedication whatsoever. That's just going to end badly. But the steering, even on these old boots, is still quite pleasant. It's very light, really, really light. And this car was both the first Ferrari with power steering and the last without. You could order an optional manual steering rack. How many of those were sold? I don't know. Other options you could have with the 355, you could have bucket seats, nearly no one spec'd those. And they did actually offer a handling pack. In fact, they later offered a Fiorano style pack for them. I think it actually was called the Fiorano pack. They did a, a Siri Fiorano, a load of spiders that they made with a lot of upgrades taken from the 355 Challenge car. And there was no real 355 Challenge Stradale equivalent. There was the 355 Challenge, but that was intended purely as a gentleman's racer. So there you have it, the Ferrari 355. I hope I've shown to you a side of it that you don't often see on YouTube videos, a little bit more under the skin, as it were. Yes, you can do lots of things to them. You can muck around with them. You can chop them about, change them, put silly wheels on. You definitely put bigger brakes and stuff on because, you know, by modern standards, so much about this car is quite lacking. But you shouldn't buy this as a performance car. Honestly, really don't. This is from a different time. But to me, a Ferrari should always look good and sound good. Being nice to drive actually is a happy coincidence. And on that front, this really is the perfect Ferrari. And plus for this car's owner, they love target top cars because you got the looks of the coupe with the roof that comes off. And Ferrari kind of discontinued that. If you want a, another little tidbit of information, there was actually a sort of 360 GTS. You see, if you ordered a 360 coupe, the Moderna, you could have it with a sunroof option. And the sunroof was a big panel that lifted out of the roof and went in the back, much like the roof in this does. I nearly bought one a few years ago. It was only about 40 odd grand. It was in a lovely green color with a green interior that wasn't as hideous as it sounds. And uh, they only made 16 of them. Apparently that's worldwide. Uh, I missed that one. I didn't have the money at the time. And I'm kind of annoyed about that because I probably would have made a lot of money on that car if I'd got it. But you know, hindsight is always 2020. For now though, I'm just going to continue enjoying driving this. I hope you guys have a lovely day. I certainly am. Please comment below. Tell me what's your favourite Ferrari. Like if you haven't already. Hit that subscribe button. Thanks guys. Bye bye.